And this is a Jenkins Developers online meetup on Dependabot for Jenkins plugin development with Oleg Nanashev. Oleg? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so, uh, just uh, for those who do not know what uh, developer uh, meetups are about, actually, there are many such people because we are just starting. It's our second meetup. Uh, so, the idea is to have regular meetups for people who contribute to Jenkins, who want to know more about the uh, development for Jenkins, mostly for plugin development, and we want to talk about uh, developer tools, any kind of best practices. So it's not just about Jenkins. We will be covering uh, common tools, uh, which other software engineers may also uh, use. Uh, the idea is to have informal discussions, mostly to focus on show and tell and demos. So we have some slide decks, uh, but uh, we can deviate from them uh, a lot, and uh, we invite everybody to participate in the discussion. Um, so, and we all, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I messed up the slides, of course. And if you're interested uh, to speak at the developer meetup, if you want to present your tool or whatever, just uh, join Advocacy and Outreach uh, Gitter channel, and we will be able um, <clears throat> to discuss uh, um, uh, topics there. So, yeah, my name is Alek Ninashov. I'm one of uh, Jenkins Core maintainers. Uh, I've been with the project since uh, 2012. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I work a lot on different development tools, including a plugin POM, plugin compatibility tester, and yeah, Dependabot, which we discussed today. I actually started doing it in uh, June this year uh, to help other plugin maintainers uh, to uh, spent less time uh, on uh, routine tasks and to focus more on uh, real development. We also have Mark Wait on the call. Mark, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, so I, mm -hmm. I maintain the Git plugin. I'm the happy beneficiary of many of the initiatives to, to provide improved tooling to people who do plugin development. So I'm the very grateful beneficiary of Oleg's efforts and others. Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, uh, today we focus um, on uh, Dependabot. Uh, so Dependabot is one of the tools uh, which allows uh, to automate dependency management for GitHub repositories. Um, if you use Bitbucket uh, or other source code systems uh, that are equivalent bots, but yeah, today we focus only on GitHub and only on a single bot, uh, though there are other uh, solutions available. Uh, if you're interested to get uh, these slides, uh, the Bitly link uh, is shared in the Zoom chat and it's also on the slide deck. So you can just open uh, them in real time unless if uh, permissions are fine. And yeah, we will focus on uh, Dependabot. I will provide a quick introduction and then I'll show how we use it in Jenkins and uh, provide some hints how to properly use it in Jenkins. That's the idea. If you have any questions, again, uh, Zoom chat. Um, uh, Mark uh, will interrupt me if needed. Um, uh, and uh, the results um, offline on a channel, uh, Platform Seek. Uh, so historically, it was Platform Special Interest Group, which started uh, using dependency management tools. And if you want to ask any questions, uh, just go there and ask. Okay, so the question to you, what's common uh, between uh, Maven, NPM, RPM, and actually almost any other system. Who does know the answer? Uh, you've seen these slides before. I have. <laughs> okay. So yeah, actually it's a dependency help. Uh, because uh, whatever dependency management system you use, eventually you end up uh, in a situation when you have hundreds of dependencies coming from different locations, you have transitive dependencies. And at some point, it's just difficult to understand what you use, um, and uh, you may get uh, the various kinds of conflicts. Uh, and yeah, eventually, your Linux system may stop working, or your Jenkins uh, plugin may end up with binary conflicts and fail to start up using the Jenkins instance sometimes. So obviously we want uh, to prevent that. In Jenkins, we actually have many kinds of dependencies. If we talk about a uh, plugin ecosystem um, and Jenkins core, so it's a common use case for development. Jenkins core may include uh, a number of libraries uh, which are exposed uh, to consumers um, as an API. So Jenkins uh, right now doesn't have uh, class isolation in between plugins and between libraries. Um, plugins uh, depend on Jenkins core. A plugin may also depend uh, on each other, and plugins may uh, depend on libraries. 
in some edge cases, we have uh, multiple plugins depending on a single library. For example, it may be Jackson, it may be Snake YAML, uh, or the commonly used uh, dependencies, which are quite popular, and uh, plugins may require them. And we also have some cases where plugins and the Jenkins core depend uh, on a single uh, library, and sometimes plugins uh, require a uh, higher version than Jenkins core. Um, it's technically possible, uh, though we won't uh, be uh, touching these parts because it's definitely not recommended. Why did we start working on the dependency management in Jenkins? Um, you may have heard about Java 11 uh, support project in Jenkins. And one of the things we had to do there is to actually update many dependencies uh, because we needed all libraries to be compatible with Java 11 when we needed to uh, update development tools. And as you may imagine, when you do bulk updates, uh, things start uh, falling apart. Sometimes it's uh, difficult to uh, recall what happens. And for me, the main takeaway from that project was that uh, actually we should have been uh, doing dependency management, uh, not uh, in bulk uh, when we need something, but actually gradually um, uh, during the project lifetime. So we would be picking uh, recent dependencies, uh, assuming that we have good CI, we would be able to discover issues, but we would be able to provide recent versions to API consumers and uh, uh, to our users, because libraries also include bug fixes, sometimes they, they include security fixes, and uh, generally we want to stay on top of it. Uh, for in Jenkins, um, the most popular uh, tool chain is uh, Java and Maven. Mm, yeah, there are some plugins which use uh, Java and um, Gradle, but yeah, Maven is uh, the most uh, common tool. And in Maven, uh, there are plugins which allow to actually uh, display available updates uh, and uh, update them. So, for example, there is a common Maven command. Uh, but uh, if you just run it, uh, you would be running it manually. And since we are talking about automation server project, is definitely not something we want uh, to do. Uh, we want to automate uh, the dependencies. And to automate the dependencies, uh, there are many tools. Uh, the most popular ones are Dependabot, which we discussed today. There is also Renovate, which is uh, more focused on front-end projects, and uh, Greenkeeper. All of them are available as uh, GitHub applications, and they integrate with Jenkins GitHub stack well. Uh, but yeah, again, uh, today our focus is Dependabot. Uh, Dependabot uh, may be the most compelling tool for GitHub because uh, GitHub has acquired the Dependabot last spring. So now Dependabot is uh, de facto part of GitHub. It's available for free for um, uh, private source uh, repositories, obviously for open source as well and uh, it gets a lot of adoption. Uh, you can use uh, Dependabot in two ways. One is a CLI tool, um, so you can just run it externally. Uh, but uh, what you can actually use with GitHub is GitHub application. So it's a tool which runs uh, in SaaS and uh, integrates with your, uh, with your repositories um, and with common uh, GitHub tools. And so you don't need to stop everything, anything. You just uh, click few um, checkboxes and get it running. And this is what we use. Um, so the idea of Dependabot is to just submit pull requests with dependencies. Mm, probably I could just show it live. Do we have any questions so far? I don't see any in the chat, and I haven't seen any come in through Platform SIG. I think we're okay, Oleg. Okay. So yeah, how it looks like in practice, uh, Dependabot submits uh, separate pull requests uh, for each dependencies. So here you can see that uh, there is a lot of pull requests being submitted by Dependabot. For example, a recent update for JUnit. Uh, um, uh, there are some updates for Maven plugins like JMaven Plus, front-end Maven plugin. We also receive updates for test libraries. This plugin POM, it's a base uh, POM for plugin development. So the most of that are about development tools. And here, if you go uh, to each of these pull requests, you can uh, see that uh, there are some additional information provided. So for example, here, so what do we have here? There is a pull request. Again, it's submitted automatically. And here you can see that there is some change log. Well, this time it wasn't parsed correctly, but at least we have a link. 
uh, which points uh, to the front end where you can see the changes available there. Also, you can uh, get a list of commits which you want to enter this release. And um, Dependable tries to do some big data. There is a page here, um, and it uh, shows compatibility stats across multiple open source projects. Because uh, when uh, many projects use uh, repositories, you can collect some additional statistics. So, so Oleg, on that yep. compatibility stats, I've seen somewhere the compatibility score was 80% roughly. Is that a concern for me? Should I be worried if the compatibility isn't a hundred percent? It's something to keep in mind. So let's uh, try to find something. <clears throat> okay, Gmaven plus. Yep, eighty percent you were mentioning. And here, ah. by the way, change logs are visualized properly in the web interface, which okay. helps the maintainers. So let's take a look at this eighty percent. Um, and here, basically. Um, you can um, get a reference to the pull request which fails. So here's just one pull request. So we can assume that uh, there were five builds uh, recently, uh, which involve uh, these updates. And here we can see why it fails. Mm. So uh, it fails on Travis. So we can just go and investigate. I have no idea what is uh, this repo about, but. Yeah, theoretically, as a maintainer, you can do some analysis and uh, evaluate risks uh, for your own. Okay, so so mm -hmm. a, 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 a less than 100% mm -hmm. is not an immediate guarantee to don't use it, but it yeah. is an inf a chance to make an informed investigation. Shall I, shall I go ahead? Thanks. Exactly. So <clears throat> this is what Dependabot basically does. You enable it for your repositories and uh, it starts sending you pull requests. Um, one good thing about uh, Dependabot that uh, it actually supports many technologies. Uh, so it's not uh, just about uh, Java Maven. Um, it also supports Gradle. It also supports other languages like JavaScript, Ruby, .NET, or if you use GitHub Actions, Go, you can also find package manager for them. You can see that some, uh, uh, some tools are in the better state. So it means that uh, there are some changes uh, happening there. For example, for Maven, uh, at some point, uh, there was issue with uh, uh, multi-model repositories. Uh, now it's uh, fixed, um, and uh, they, they keep evolving in order to support uh, advanced Maven features, because you can pass versions through properties, through bill of materials, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we use in Jenkins now, we use uh, Dependabot for uh, Maven Gradle, for JavaScript, Ruby, and for Docker. Uh, we will briefly uh, talk about uh, this packaging. And if you have any questions, again, just ask. I have a few slides about uh, enabling Dependabot. Uh, but again, uh, let's just uh, take a look at uh, that uh, in real. Uh, before I... Uh, chosen one of my repositories which is called a job restrictions plugin so it's just a plugin for um, um, prevention of uh, job execution when a user has no permissions based on ownership or other conditions and also for protecting master so here right now i don't have dependabot enabled and if you go to the plugin form you can see that uh, there are some dependencies defined so we use a plugin form the repository i was showing this version is 3.18 so it's almost 30 versions behind uh, we also have dependency on uh, jenkins core uh, and we have uh, uh, two plugin dependencies for test purposes one is matrix project and another one is matrix authorization uh, plugin so what we will do here um, I just have Dependabot interface somewhere. Yes, here. So I need uh, to enable Dependabot. I will be using SaaS because I don't want to spend time. And uh, there are, uh, um, so if you use Dependabot in your organization, firstly, you will need to add it to your organization. I will skip this step because we already have it in Jenkins. What we need to do next, we need to add our repositories uh, to the, our repository to dependency checks. So here, I just click a button at the repository. You can see a number of uh, repositories offered because at some point, uh, Dependabot uh, access was granted uh, for them. Uh, but uh, there is no job restrictions plugin because I need uh, to grant access. Why we need that um, is because of um, 
permissions, depend about uh, needs uh, right uh, access uh, to code, uh, to issues and pull requests, because it needs to edit labels, it needs to submit pull requests, it also provides some chat ops operations. And here we are going to just add a job restrictions plugin. Uh, so if you are plugin maintainers, you will see only plugins uh, to which you have administrative access. Um, and uh, if you don't have administrative access to your plugin, uh, you just need to submit a, an issue and we will fix it uh, on the Jenkins uh, project site. So I save permissions, I granted access to this repository and then I will just refresh this page. Okay. And here we have job restrictions plugin. Uh, I edit it. By default, it will be building uh, for Java Maven for me. Um, and that's uh, what uh, we need to do. So here you can see that uh, there is job restrictions and there is a, a flag checking uh, now. So we will need to wait for a while. And while we wait, uh, I'll just uh, proceed with the presentation. It, because I haven't tried it for this repository, I cannot say what uh, exactly we will end up with, but let's see. Uh, just a second, there are some questions or not in the chat. Okay, no. I didn't see, I, yeah, I don't see any, any questions okay. there, although I was yeah, noting that you were at the apps.dependabot.com website in order to manage those, to manage the, the permissions and the controls? Yep. Is that, did I see that correctly? Yes, I use dependabot.com, but it's okay. a GitHub application, so it's connected to GitHub. All right, so, but, okay. but great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's wait. So I just opened this repository and you can see that uh, there is already a uh, first pull request landing. So if you enable it uh, for, uh, for the big project, uh, you may actually uh, receive dozens uh, of uh, pull requests on the first run. But in this case, uh, there are not so many dependencies, so we can just let it run. And yeah, meanwhile, I will talk about uh, more advanced features of Dependabot, which we actually use in the project. So release note references, I've already presented them. And actually, um, it changes well with the change log automation uh, story, which we were discussing in the previous developer meetup. Because if you use GitHub releases, if you use tools like Release Drafter, you can uh, get fancy looking change log, which is automatically generated. And you can uh, pass it through downstream dependencies. So you get additional benefits from using um, GitHub releases for such change logs. Another thing which is useful for Dependabot is comment ops. So let's go to our pull request, which was submitted somewhere. Okay, so here, um, Dependabot, um, yeah, it has some front end, but you can also talk to it uh, uh, through commands. And there is a number of commands uh, you can use. So for example, uh, if you uh, have some merge conflicts, etc., you can ask to rebase uh, uh, the change. You can also um, <clears throat> uh, say that uh, please ignore this version. If you want to skip it uh, due to whatever reason, uh, uh, you can um, uh, set some additional configuration, for example, uh, set reviewers, Sign is, but I don't use uh, these commands because uh, there is a better way to do it. Uh, but uh, these commands uh, are available. So usually, oh. what I yes, sorry, mm -hmm. disrupting. I really have found useful the ignore this major and ignore this minor. But in mm -hmm. my case, I think I had it had a, the wrong configuration. The things I was ignoring, mm -hmm. I should have ignored in a config file at all. But oh, whatever works. Okay. Um, so we do, uh, we will talk about configuration as code a bit later. Uh, but yeah, it's your choice as a plugin maintainer. In my case, I use uh, Rebase a lot. You can and also use Dependabot Merge, um, and this is intelligent merge, so it will do a merge when the CI passes, uh, which is uh, useful, and yeah, it combines with CI Jenkins IO, which builds uh, Jenkins components. And yeah, there are some other pull requests available. Okay, uh, so yeah, we also get a few extra pull requests coming in. Uh, so, for example, this is our plugin form, and for plugin form, uh, what I wanted to show, yeah, this is change logs. Again, these are fully automatically generated by other tools, so yeah, you can use them. 
Um, and uh, there are some, two plugin updates. So we can see that plugin form, it passed the CI, so I could just merge it. Uh, and we have um, uh, test failing. So here, matrix project, we tried to update the plugin and it failed. So why did it fail? Let's see. Okay, it failed uh, due to require upper bounds. Uh, not surprising, and we will talk about it uh, later in the presentation. So, yeah, let's just move on then. So, one another feature which Marcus has already hinted is configuration as code. Because indeed, you can uh, configure everything for depend about, uh, from web UI, but in such case, it's hard to trace dependencies, it's hard for other contributors to understand what's there. Uh, but you can configure everything using uh, settings. And here I have an example. Uh, for example, let's take a look at another plugin, uh, Apple Strategy plugin. So here you can see that uh, there is a dot depend bot uh, folder and it includes config YAML. Uh, and config YAML includes uh, some options. Uh, for example, uh, here I say that I do dependency management for Maven uh, in the root. So everything under the root, including submodels, will be checked. Um, check uh, is weekly. There are some uh, default reviewers assigned. This feature was introduced before code owners uh, were added to GitHub. So I would say that right now it's rather obsolete, but it's available. Uh, you can wait a sec. So could yeah. you give some more words on code owners and how that applies here? So I could skip default reviewers if I were using code owners? Yes, you can, because um, uh, code owners is a new GitHub feature which allows to uh, set up reviewers uh, on the global level or based on particular patterns. So, for example, here we have a GitHub team or strategy plugin developers, and this team reviews all incoming pull requests. So, when a new pull request uh, comes in, it doesn't matter whether it's a dependable bot or not dependable bot one, uh, the team is requested. So, yeah. Uh, this feature is uh, rather obsolete. Uh, it's not something uh, I would recommend to use right now. Um, and uh, there is a lot of other features uh, available um, uh, through configuration as code. Uh, Dependabot has really good documentation. And here, for example, it's not also documentation. They also offer validation tool, which you can use to verify configurations. Uh, but for validation, uh, let's uh, see what we have. Uh, so you can uh, set up uh, scale, you can set up target branches if you use multi-branch repositories, reviewers, assignments, labels, milestones, depending on uh, your tools. You can uh, either blacklist updates, so it's ignored updates, or allow particular updates if you want uh, to rather focus on the updates. You can set up auto-merge. So if you are totally confident in your continuous integration, uh, you can say that uh, if CI passes, just merge. No manual action required. Right? So, and yes. So I've been using milestones in one of my projects. That's a GitHub capability. This will mm -hmm. allow me to set a default milestone that should be assigned for pull. That's great. OK, thank you. You've shown mm -hmm. me auto merge updates, which I need on one of my plugins, and default milestone, which I need on another one. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. So what else we have? Uh, there are some uh, languages and some languages also have additional features. So for example, for JavaScript, you can set up live updates because they talk to NPM, receive webhooks uh, from there. Uh, so they get uh, dynamic updates, uh, no need to set up daily or whatever. Same for NuGet if you use .NET. But yeah, for Java, we have only this at the moment, all these. But still, it's something uh, useful. And if needed, you can always go to the uh, web interface and trigger update manually. Because here, there is a magic bump now a button, which actually which will trigger uh, the update if needed. OK, so what else do we have in this presentation? Yeah, one thing I want to mention is that there is no org-wide uh, configuration support. Um, for release drafter, for example, what we do, uh, release drafter is based on the ProBot. It's a common framework for GitHub applications and actions. And uh, here we have a global configuration which covers the most of the use cases, and this configuration is shared between plugins. It's not what can, uh, you can use in Dependabot at the moment, but hopefully this feature is coming soon so that uh, we won't uh, need to duplicate the configs and we will be able to do 
define common templates, for example, for Jenkins plugins. Because, uh, yeah, I'll talk about it later. There are use cases we need to cover, but uh, right now it's available uh, <coughs> only <coughs> uh, in manual. Well, another in, feature. Yes. Isn't there already hiding in that release drafter that there are mm -hmm. labels defined for release drafter, which I, I should actually use mm -hmm. or encourage Dependabot to use to flag mm -hmm. a dependency, a proposed dependency update? Yeah, right. Uh, so Dependabot has default labels. For example, it uh, sets dependencies label on uh, every pull request, which it sends. And uh, when you update the things, what we do in our tooling, we have category dependency updates. Uh, which also includes a uh, dependable. So for example, here you can see that between uh, releases 2.13 and 2.14, we had a dependable submitting four pull requests with configuration code plugin updates. And uh, here is our change log. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, there are other updates here and there. If you take a look at uh, another tool like plugin form, you can see that uh, there are even more updates coming from dependable because yeah, there is just a, a lot more dependencies included there. So for example, here depend about, here depend about. So yeah, uh, it definitely gets a lot of contributions uh, across the Jenkins organization. Okay, another feature which I won't be presenting, but which uh, worth knowing about is security because uh, Dependabot also integrates with GitHub uh, security. It's tooling which allows uh, silent tracking um, uh, vulnerabilities, etc. Again, it was introduced uh, last spring uh, by GitHub. And what Dependabot does, uh, now it submits a uh, pull request using security API. So you do not see it uh, in public, uh, but you see these changes as maintainer and you can properly handle them. For example, prepare CVs, prepare security advisories like we do in Jenkins. So updates with, with known security vulnerabilities won't be displayed in common pull requests and you can uh, rely on it uh, quite safely. It was one of the main uh, concerns when we started um, uh, Dependabot adoption, but it was uh, addressed uh, quite quickly. So, oh, like mm -hmm. we had a, a request to ask a question from Sladen yep. Nunes. Um, Sladen, did you want to go ahead and ask your question now? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, my question was that uh, I think Dependabot also updates Docker images. So, um, does Jenkins use it to does uh, I mean Jenkins use it to update Docker Im images currently? I'm not yes. sure. So, that was my question. Yes, we do. Um, so, my plan is to finish with Maven part because it's uh, the most popular one, and then I have uh, a few examples for JavaScript and for Docker. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So let's uh, speak uh, about Jenkins specifics. Um, so as I said, we started evaluating the Dependabot in June. Um, right now it's enabled in more than 60 repositories. A lot of development tools use Dependabot, some plugins use Dependabot. And um, uh, by the time of, uh, well, in December it created uh, almost 2,000 pull requests. So now maybe we are looking at something like uh, 2,500, I should have updated this slide. And I would say that the Pandabot really saves time uh, because uh, yeah, if you create this pull request manually, you just uh, have to spend a lot of time if you want to prepare a proper pull request uh, to reference change logs, to reference addressed issues, but the Pandabot does it for you. So I found it uh, really useful though. Yeah, first burst of pull request sometimes uh, makes you cry uh, because uh, <laughs> Yeah, in one repository, I've got something like 30 or 40 pull requests, uh, sometimes uh, major bumps with two or three, uh, skipping two or three major versions. So obviously CI failed, uh, but yeah, that's not the point. The point is that uh, in common, when you figure out uh, all these updates, it uh, becomes quite uh, reliable and uh, you integrate things gradually, so you do not need to, uh, to spend uh, uh, too much time. Though there are some pitfalls to know about uh, if you want to use Dependabot uh, uh, for the plugin. One thing is that you should definitely use Dependabot to update parent form and to update developer tools. So for example, if you use Maven plugins and other components, you should be using it because uh, you just stay on recent versions and get bug fixes. Uh, in the case of plugin form, there is uh, 
a lot of uh, embedded tools like static analysis, injected tests, and um, again, we update uh, them automatically. So when you keep your parent form up to date, you get uh, the recent updates. Also, uh, what you shouldn't do is to actually update plugin dependencies to the latest versions. Because uh, plugin dependencies in Jenkins means a completely different thing uh, than in common, for example, in uh, Maven projects. Uh, so if we take a look, okay, let's go back to job restrictions plugin. Or let's take let's take something else, configuration code. Uh, so here, um, if you go to configuration code plugin, you can see that uh, there is a lot of dependencies that are declared here. Uh, okay, not not a lot. I I definitely went uh, to wrong repository. Okay, let's go back. Uh, Git plugin. Then. Yeah, that one certainly declares several dependencies. Okay. Yeah, so what we have here, we define a few dependencies on plugins. You can see here dependencies do not include versions because I suspect uh, uh, Mark uses a uh, bill of materials now. On, on this experiment, yes, that's correct. Okay, so again, uh, wrong. Oh, oh, sorry. So that's, yeah, yeah. right. You okay. Are. Let, let's take safe example. Uh, so role strategy plugin. So here you have um, uh, some dependencies declared. You can see that uh, there is a plugin dependency and, and uh, here's another plugin dependency. Uh, and uh, these plugin dependencies may be in different scopes. So for example, here we have um, a common scope dependency. It means that uh, our plugin requires matrix authorization plugin version 2.2. And if you let Dependabot to update this version, uh, then uh, Dependabot uh, will push it, no problem. Uh, but what it means uh, that the plugin will actually require a newer version of this plugin, and it will force all the users of these plugins to update, uh, which uh, might make sense, uh, but uh, you should be careful with it because uh, uh, you, uh, your plugin users uh, just uh, lose uh, freedom to manage other plugins. And sometimes if there are regressions in those stream, et cetera, it's better not to update. Um, yeah, so same yeah. Oleg, for me, the, the distinction, Hamcrest, for instance, here is altering generated code, not the later runtime environment. Whereas mm -hmm. if I depend on a newer version of a Jenkins plugin, I'm demanding something from the Jenkins runtime environment. Exactly. So Hamcrest here is a test dependency, and for example, uh, uh, folders plugin is also a test dependency. It means only that these plugins are used for testing. Um, it still includes uh, some uh, requirements for transitive dependencies, but uh, these dependencies can be relatively safely updated if you know uh, what you want to achieve. But for these uh, mandatory dependencies, you should be careful. Uh, same for the Jenkins core. So here we have a dependency which uh, use Jenkins dot version. So what it means is that it's minimal required Jenkins core version. It doesn't, uh, uh, sometimes people do a mistake and uh, follow the recent weekly uh, just because uh, it's uh, more convenient. But uh, again, it cuts off, for example, Jenkins LTS users and users of previous LTS versions. So our recommendation is to be careful with um, updates of Jenkins version and definitely not to pick a recent version. Uh, for example, what uh, the practice I use in my plugins is to just uh, stay behind uh, two LTSs for my plugins. Um, if you want uh, to have more insights how versions impact your plugin, there is a site called uh, um, Stats Jenkins IO, and here we can see uh, plugin versions by Jenkins version. And let's take, for example, Git plugin. Uh, Oh, oh, wait, wait patiently. That's a big page. Okay. There, yeah. It's and, and this this page is. I cannot pr sing the praises enough of that page in terms of what it helps you see about the distribution of installations mm -hmm. of your plugin versions. Yeah, right. So here, for example, I have taken a role strategy, uh, and you can see that uh, the majority of my users are still on the previous LTS baseline. But uh, but but they are on the previous LTS. You could you can confidently say 2.190 is a safe mm -hmm. version. If you're going back, you're you're abandoning 25. Well, no, that okay. There are a bunch of users one mm -hmm. one major LT, one LTS back. Yeah. 
So we had a Christmas break, so you can see that many people still didn't update uh, to the recent LTS. Um, we had a new security release announced uh, for the next week. Uh, so yeah, I guess in the one week the situation will change drastically. Uh, but according to plugin stats on January 1st, this is uh, the distribution we had. So the next month statistics uh, will be more aligned. Okay. Um, Anyway, let's uh, go back to slide deck because yeah, uh, we have some uh, things to cover. So uh, one other thing uh, to be really careful of is library updates um, because uh, library updates, uh, well, they are like plugins, but uh, they may conflict with Jenkins code, they may conflict with each other. And uh, for what it was, we also have transitive dependencies. Um, again, you should be really careful about them. Uh, fortunately, Maven offers tools which you can use, and these tools are included in the, our standard plugin POM. So if you use uh, Jenkins plugin POM, or if you use uh, Jenkins POM for libraries, you get uh, these uh, checks automatically. Uh, there is Maven Enforcer plugin, which applies require upper bounds rule. Um, it uh, helps to prevent uh, um, transitive dependencies. So you've seen uh, an error I had um, in CI before for job restrictions. It's specifically this rule. Uh, there are also some additional rules, for example, the extra enforcer rules, which enforce some bad code compatibility checks so that um, you don't get updated to uh, versions which uh, do not support Java 8 uh, anymore, for example. And uh, yeah, make sure that uh, you keep this rule enabled as well. So the default configuration, um, yeah, it's uh, quite straightforward. If you don't uh, use Jenkins, you can uh, set up a Maven plugin called Maven Enforcer. And in the configuration, you put a rule like require upper bounds. And after that, uh, this rule gets applied with some excludes. Um, and you get uh, the thing running. <clears throat> it helps us a lot uh, with dependencies because, um, um, again, um, when you bump one dependency, you may get issues with transitive dependencies, and uh, maybe an enforcer plugin will show you a plug if something is not aligned, so that you actually rely uh, on an uh, older version that you are supposed to use due to dependency requirements. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we use. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have some tools uh, which simplify dependency management because dependency management may be overwhelming. Uh, if you take a look at Mark's Git plugin, how many plugin dependencies do you have, Mark? An embarrassing number, and every one of them required, every one of them necessary. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, if we want to see it in a fancy way, we just go to the plugin side. Yes, which uh, is another way to view the embarrassing number of dependencies. Yeah, some of them are optional, but still. Yeah, optional doesn't doesn't change that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a common situation for all the plugins. It's even worse because there are more implied dependencies. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have a number of dependencies. And you can see that Mark actually doesn't define so many dependencies here. Why? Uh, it's because we, he uses another tool called uh, Bill of Materials. So in Maven, you can uh, declare dependencies in external repositories. And here, uh, you use a, uh, where do you declare bomb? Yeah, here. So here, Mark uh, declares a plugin bomb. It's a repository created uh, by JC Greek, uh, which um, includes uh, some uh, plugin dependencies. Uh, yeah, let me open it. Okay, so it's here. Uh, what it includes, it includes a set of plugins, uh, actually quite a number of plugins. I just need to find them. Yeah, for example, uh, we can take uh, 150 baseline, and here you can Okay. I tried. Go to bottom list. Okay, thank you. Uh, wrong thing. So yeah, you can see that uh, there is a bunch of plugins here. And uh, JC uses tools like plugin compatibility tester in order to verify these dependencies. So you can consume this bill of materials and you can be more or less confident that uh, these plugins at least don't explode with each other uh, because we use um, uh, tools uh, offered by Jenkins project which verify these dependencies. And notably, this repository also uses Dependabot. So you can see a number of incoming pull requests which uh, try to update versions. Uh, currently, everything is 
is in red because yeah, we have uh, change in configuration of code APIs, and I guess uh, there are also some infrastructure instabilities. Uh, but generally, dependabot uh, is used um, in order to bump the dependencies. And here we can also see some fancy releases. Uh, uh, basically, again, yeah, we can see that uh, plugin dependencies are updated by dependabot. So if uh, you want to simplify your life, for example, for test dependencies, especially if you use pipeline plugin, then uh, going with uh, Jenkins CI bomb is uh, the recommendation. Uh, yeah, pipeline, yeah. Jenkins, the Jenkins bomb that Jesse had created made my life dealing with work, workflow with pipeline plugin dependencies mm -hmm. much, much better. I, I reduced significantly the time required to decode which combinations of plugin versions were allowed to work. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another side uh, of this, um, I think, is uh, Jenkins Core Bomb. It's a new feature which has been added by Mike Sirioli and James North um, in uh, recent Jenkins versions. So it's available uh, starting from LCS 2.204, one which was released in December. Uh, but James has also created the backports for previous versions. So basically it's a file which includes uh, information about libraries included in the Jenkins core versions. Because unfortunately, we had cases when uh, the libraries were declared as conflicting dependencies. So sometimes it was uh, leading to various kinds of binary conflicts. And uh, this file um, aligns uh, dependencies which are used inside the Jenkins code. And if you use uh, recent plugin form versions, uh, you actually have to enable uh, BOM manually. Uh, but we are working on a plugin POM um, 4.0, which uh, includes it uh, out of the box. And here there is a reference to BOM. Uh, yep. uh, basically, um, if you use uh, 4.0 beta, you automatically get these dependencies as a part of your tool chain when you use uh, the uh, plugin form. And you can uh, get rid of explicit uh, version definitions uh, inside your plugin and rely on a uh, plugin form to provide it. So you can uh, be confident that each time you build, you build with the dependencies required for this particular Jenkins code version. So, yeah. um, so the recommendation for Maven, definitely use enforcers, definitely use a build of materials if you use complex projects. And uh, together with good CI and with uh, Dependabot, you can get a pretty st uh, stable flow of updates coming for your project. I want to spend a few, uh, a few minutes on uh, other languages and tools, unless there are questions. Anyone? That's great. Keep Go forward. I think we've only got about 15 minutes, so I think other languages is perfect. Let's please go ahead. Okay. Okay, so what else uh, do we use in Jenkins now? We use Docker and JavaScript. Again, uh, there are other technologies and tools you can use. Um, for Docker, the use case is obvious uh, because if you have Docker, you also have also some dependencies. Uh, for example, let's open Docker file here. It's for Jenkins file runner. Uh, uh, and here you can see that uh, there are a few dependencies declared here. So this is multi-stage Docker build. And here I use a version of Maven. And I also use version of OpenGDK below. And uh, for here, I use a specific version of uh, Maven. It's a right approach. So every time Maven updates, I will get a pull request from Dependabot. Uh, but here, I use a, a tag. And this is actually a bad approach. Because, for example, if um, a new release of uh, uh, Java is uh, delivered, uh, and if there is a security fix, then uh, if I use such approach, uh, I won't get a pull request from Dependabot, and my uh, uh, might lag behind. It's not a problem for Jenkins file runner because it's in beta, but uh, yeah, for other repositories, it's something to consider. And here's an example of Maven update because yeah, Dependabot was able uh, to discover Maven. It was unable to capture change log because uh, Docker Hub doesn't uh, distribute information for official images. So for Docker, uh, you can just uh, get the version and then you have to figure out what's between these versions. But yeah, that's what we have. And for labels, um, I didn't uh, set up uh, filters. And here what I see do is uh, the Java version in this repository. No, 
It's in another repository in plugin Kamquat tester. Basically, I used uh, the same approach for the development tool here. Uh, yeah, wrong hyperlink. <clears throat> so here you can see that uh, there is update uh, of Maven. And uh, you can uh, see one artifact, which is, I would rather consider it as a bug in Docker. Uh, but uh, basically, Docker tries uh, to interpolate some versions. Uh, they use a lot of manual checks uh, for common patterns. But here you can see that it uh, passed the version. It uh, determined that uh, a number on the end is actually a part of the version. So here is updated from Java 8 to Java 13. As you may guess, it fails. But well, yeah, that's okay. But that's a that's a terrifying proposal. <laughs> Because this is saying change the Java. That probably means the Java version, right? And the Java version mm -hmm. used to be eight, and they're proposing to go to something that is is not a long term support Java release, and is is certainly not Java eight. Yeah, uh, good news okay. uh, is that you can actually set up filters. When I was talking about what to update and what to not update, I forgot to mention it. But since we are here, let's return a bit. So uh, if you want to set up uh, some rules, uh, what to update, you can uh, use uh, um, a configuration file. So here I have configuration for ignore updates. And here you can see that I ignore uh, all uh, Jenkins core dependencies. So basically I don't update Jenkins core. I also do not update plugins like it in standard packages. So or Jenkins CI plugins, or IO Jenkins plugins. It's not a silver bullet because uh, Jenkins plugins uh, may be released with different uh, group IDs, but at least it uh, covers a majority of uh, plugins. And if you're a plugin maintainer, you can uh, set up uh, your own uh, filters. And they, it's not uh, limited to just uh, these types. Uh, if I go to the dependable settings, you can see that uh, yeah, they use uh, GitHub API as an example, much appreciated. Uh, but uh, what you can see here, you can also uh, set additional types, for example, um, version requirements. There are also other filters which are not mentioned here. You can um, uh, ignore uh, dependency types, so you can uh, update on the test dependencies, on the uh, uh, common scope dependencies. So Dependabot uh, got a lot of features for Maven already and counting. So. Yeah, uh, you can set up your own filtering if you want to avoid cases like that. But yeah, just uh, keep in mind that obviously you shouldn't accept any update. Okay, so for me, the main idea, the main reason to have Docker auto updates is to actually uh, have Jenkins agents auto updates, which is a nightmare at the moment for a maintainer. Um, and yeah, we will eventually get there. But right now, uh, Docker is also under evaluation for Jenkins project. Same for JavaScript. We have several plugins and components which use uh, JavaScript. Nothing changes specifically, so Dependabot can determine NPM, it can de uh, determine Yarn and other standard uh, um, uh, packaging. And for example, I just opened uh, the plugin site, um, and here you can see that uh, there is a lot of uh, updates coming uh, for JavaScript. And well, it's uh, the same as for everything else. Uh, for JavaScript, actually, they have uh, much better diagnostics just because uh, there is a lot more JavaScript projects. And yeah, I'm not sure what's the statistic here. Um, it just uh, takes a while to load uh, this information. But yep, eventually it will also show information about uh, failing pull requests. Also change logs and other things. So you get uh, the same for um, uh, JavaScript. Yeah, basically, for other tools, there are some specific flags, uh, flags available, uh, but um, it remains the same for almost any technology. So the know-how there is how to parse files, how to submit patches, and the uh, dependable uh, does it pretty well. The dependency check engine is more or less the same. Okay, mm, just a few items as a summary. Mm. Mm, and then we will have some time for Kone. So yeah, if you develop software, consider automating dependency management for your projects. It helps really well. It saves uh, a lot of time in longer term. Uh, 
Um, we already had a few cases when uh, Dependabot helped us uh, to prevent uh, uh, security issues because Dependabot picked uh, the releases uh, long before the advisory was published and uh, finally we had it post factum. Um, and yeah, if you automate the dependencies, so there are tools for that. And today we present in Dependabot, but again, it's just one example of a tool. Uh, you can also write your own tool if you want uh, uh, for your components. Uh, and Dependabot is pluggable, so you can write uh, plugins for your language. Um, and specifically for Maven, be careful about the transitive dependencies because the most of the problems come from there. If you don't use Maven Enforcer, just don't use Dependabot, uh, spend some time uh, in order to uh, add additional static analysis checks, and of course, make sure that you have uh, uh, good uh, continuous integration set up. So uh, we work on Jenkins, so we are supposed to have a good CA, and we have a lot of tools for plugins. And uh, if you measure your test code coverage, um, then it's great because you can also discover uh, potential gaps uh, where dependency updates are not covered. For us, what's next um, is to document uh, how we use the Panda bot. It would be also great to have global configurations. So, for example, for plugins, we could have a common template which uh, defines a whitelist uh, for dependency updates, which uh, skips uh, plugin updates by default so that we don't have issues with it. Uh, which also disables uh, some library updates because we have API plugins, uh, which would be a recommended way. And it would be great to configure that and then uh, to facilitate adoption in more repositories. Because, because we are still at something like 60 repositories and depend, uh, adoption of Dependabot is slower than for other tools uh, because of the complexity. So if you could uh, document that, if you uh, we could provide configuration, it would be much more convenient for end users of Jenkins. That's the plan. If you want to know more, there is a lot of information. Uh, so there is Dependabot website, which includes documentation um, uh, about configuration as code, about using Dependabot, about some pitfalls. This documentation is quite good. Uh, we can also discuss everything in the community. Uh, please use Platform Special Interest Group for QA if you want to follow up after um, this meetup. And there is a developer mailing list where we discuss uh, Dependabot evaluation. It was uh, not detective for a while, because there were uh, other threads, but yeah, if you want, you can this one. Uh, you can use this one. And there is also a bunch of examples. Some of them I presented today, so you can just uh, uh, Google for them and um, check out how we configure and use Dependabot in our repositories. Okay, uh, that's it uh, from me, and thanks uh, to everybody who was on the call. I guess now we have some time to answer questions. And Sladen had another question. So okay. he notes in the chat that part of his proposal for Docker polling project as part of Google Summer of Code was mm -hmm. to send pull requests to repositories when a base image update or a security patch had occurred. Could this be done with Dependabot or is it rather better to be done with a separate plugin? What's, what's the preference? Mm, so one of the problems, um, so Dependabot relies on databases for updates and uh, there is uh, Dependabot doesn't use a specific uh, databases uh, which identify about security updates earlier. So if you are comfortable with eventual um, updates and eventual security, then Dependabot is probably fine. But for example, if you're a customer of uh, organizations which uh, notify you about security vulnerabilities, which provide proactive scans and other tools, then you might want to implement something on your own. Okay. Uh, whether it's a common use case, uh, yeah, we had that, but uh, I'm not sure how common uh, it is across the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this part still makes sense. Um, also, um, if we talk about the JSOC project, uh, running uh, security scans uh, for Docker, it has to happen somewhere. For example, uh, in Jenkins, you can use Unsure and other tools, uh, and you can provide uh, proposed dependencies based on that information. Again, uh, Dependabot uh, doesn't provide you much insights so, uh, why uh, this update is needed right now. It, it provides some metadata references to CVs, but um, you would ne still need to analyze the impact of this update, run CI, so uh, it's not mutually exclusive. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions, comments? So you mentioned you mentioned that mm -hmm. there are sometimes security notices. So I received a security notice for a particular Jenkins plugin, mm -hmm. a total of 25 installations, tiny number of installations. Was that coming from Dependabot? I thought that was coming from GitHub. What, what can you te teach me about that? Uh, so what I can uh, is, uh, teach you about that. Um, well, basically, I couldn't teach much without the disclosing potential vulnerabilities, I guess. Um, so well, so, so the one that I had was UI Themes plugin, UI Themes dash plugin. Okay. And, and it was just an out of date dependency. And it said mm -hmm. this dependency is catastrophically out of date. It needs to move forward this large number of, of steps to be fixed. Yeah. So uh, uh, one thing um, about it is that. Uh, a dependent bot is deeply integrated with GitHub now, and at some point it doesn't really matter. So for security, I believe they use uh, dependent bot on their own, whatever you configure. Uh, okay. At least dependent bot course to suggest the dependencies. But if I recall correctly, the pull requests are still referenced as uh, dependent bot. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I can double check, but. Well, no, no, no need just mm -hmm. trying i was trying to comprehend what mm -hmm. I, I was really pleased to get the notice it was great to be told hey there's a problem and then think about what does this problem mm -hmm. mean yeah uh, if you're interested to know more how dependabot is organized actually there are repositories dependabot itself is open source so you can just check it out you can uh, find out uh, the logic and we had to do it a few times uh, to understand why it doesn't behave as we expected uh, so dependabot is mostly uh, written in ruby but yeah, the code is uh, quite good um, one thing to keep in mind is about license because um, it's not an MIT license. Uh, basically, you can uh, use it uh, for non-commercial purpose as you wish. So for example, we can take it and run a uh, dependabot CLI tool on Jenkins infrastructure if you want. Uh, but if you want uh, to make it as a commercial feature, then yeah, then do not. OK, so it is mm -hmm. not a BSD or MIT style license. OK. Yes. Got it. Mm -hmm. but for us as Jenkins community is perfectly fine. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we use a Dependabot as a GitHub application because Dependabot, uh, when it operates, it pulls um, the change logs, it pulls GitHub, so it would consume REST API limit and other things. So for us, it's more convenient to use GitHub. Well, Oleg, we have, we have just very nearly reached our time. Anything you want to say in conclusion? Nothing from me, just tame your dependencies and be careful with them. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and for watching this video. Thanks, everybody. We'll end the meeting now. The recording will be posted to the Jenkins YouTube channel. Thanks very, very much. Yeah. Thank you.